So organ failure due to natural aging or disease is a critical medical challenge. The current treatment for organ failure relies mostly on organ transplantation from living or disease donors. So this problem of organ shortage has escalated over the last three decades. So there are numerous patients on the waiting list for organ transplantation have died due to the scarcity of suitable donors. Whereas the recipient with successful organ transplantation, they are usually subjected to constant immunosuppression to prevent acute or chronic graft rejection. And so, this problem could be potentially solved by using autologous cells derived from a patient's own cells to create a 3D patient-specific replacement organ using 3D bioprinting. So this would potentially minimize the risk of organ rejection and also eliminate the need for lifelong immunosuppression. So unlike the conventional tissue engineering approach, which relies on the use of super scaffold to support cell proliferation, differentiation, and tissue formation, 3D bioprinting is a highly automated manufacturing platform for the fabrication of complex bioengineered construct, whereby the living cells and biomaterials were precisely deposited via a layer-by-layer -layer fabrication process to control the spatial arrangement of all these functional components within the complex 3D tissue engineered constructs. So this is how a typical process for the bioprinting of 3D tissue looks like. So it includes the imaging, the design, the material and cell selection, bioprinting process, and the applications. So usually non-invasive imaging modalities such as CT or MRI, they are usually used to collect the raw imaging data, which are then further processed to produce multiple 2D cross-sectional images. And next, during the design phase, it is important to achieve tissue biomimicry, which means uh, to facilitate the specific arrangement of the living cells and also the supporting cell types, the composition and the microstructure of the engineered extracellular matrix, the ECM, and next for the materials and cell selection. So there are some key considerations which includes the material printability, the biocompatibility, the degradation kinetics, the material biomimicry, which refers to the relevant mechanical and biological cues for cell proliferation and differentiation. And for the cell source, the selected cells should be able to expand into sufficient numbers for bioprinting. And it should also consist of multiple types of cells, such as the functional and also the supportive cells. And later in the subsequent sections, I'll elaborate more on the various bioprinting techniques and their different applications. So according to the ASM standards, the bioprinting techniques can be classified into three main groups, which are the material extrusion, material jetting, and vet polymerization. So for the material extrusion technique, it includes a mechanical and pneumatic. For the material jetting approach, we have the inject, micro valve, laser assisted, and acoustic bioprinting. For the vet polymerization, we have the stereolithography, SLA, digital light processing, DLP, and also two-photon polymerization, 2PP. Next, we have a comparative analysis of the different bioprinting techniques. So the working principle for the material extrusion can be either pneumatic or mechanical extrusion. As for the material jetting, it requires the use of actuators to overcome the surface tension. And also we have bed polymerization, which requires the photopolymerization of the photo initiators. 
So for the nozzle size, usually for material extrusion, the nozzle diameter will be 100 microns or greater. And for the material jetting, the nozzle size will be typically in the range of 80 to 250 microns. Whereas for the vet polymerization, it is a nozzleless uh, printing technique. So the light source will directly cure the resin within the printing tray. Next, we look at the printability. So for the material extrusion, it's dependent on the viscosity, the use stress, the storage, and the loss modulus. And some other important consideration includes the tissotrophic properties, which refers to the ability to return close to its original viscosity upon removal of the shear stress, the layer thickness, and also the degree of overlapping during the printing process. For the material jetting, the printability is dependent on this dimensionless Z number. So this is dependent on the ink viscosity, surface tension, density, and also size of the nozzle. So some critical parameters to take note includes the formation of satellite droplets during inject printing, the droplet impact velocity, and also the droplet substrate interaction. And for the vet polymerization, the rate of the photopolymerization is dependent on the incident light intensity, the power over the area, the photo initiator concentration and its uh, efficiency, the molar extinction coefficient, which refers to the absorptivity, and also the quantum U, which is the cleavage event per absorb, uh, per absorb photons. So some uh, important consideration for this uh, vet polymerization includes designing a base layer or good adhesion between the printed construct and a built platform, and also to minimize the cross-sectional area of each printed layers to lower the force experienced by the printed constructs during the peeling step. So in terms of the printing resolution, you can see that the vet polymerization can achieve the highest printing resolution which is around 20 to 50 microns for the SLA and DLP techniques. And it can even go down to the sub-micron resolution for 2PP techniques. So this uh, printing resolution is usually controlled by tuning the laser power and also the irradiation time. Next, for the material extrusion and material jetting approach, so usually the resolution is highly dependent on the nozzle diameter, which is typically in the range of uh, about 200 micron resolution for material extrusion, and about 150 microns for inject material jetting approach. So next we look at the viscosity requirements. So for the material extrusion, it ranges between 30 about 10 million millipascal second. For the material jetting approach, it's about 1 to 70 millipascal second. And for the vet polymerization approach, it's less than typically less than 5,000 millipascal second. Next, we look at the maximum printable cellular density. You can see that for the material extrusion and material jetting approach, is typically within the range of a million cells per ml. But for the vet polymerization, because uh, it doesn't have a nozzle, so it's able to pr uh, print much higher cell density in the range of 100 million cells per ml. Next, we look at the cell viability. So for the material extrusion approach, the cells will experience uh, the shear stress during the printing process. So this is the main factor that affects the cell viability. Whereas for the cells uh, in the material injecting approach, it's dependent on both the shear stress and also the, the droplet uh, impact on the substrate surface. The cell viability for the vet polymerization technique is dependent on the light wavelength, intensity, 
irradiation time and also the photo initiator concentration. Next, we shall look at the trend in the 3D bioprinting techniques over the last few decades. You can see that for the material extrusion, it has the highest number of publication followed by material jetting and also the depth polymerization. So here you can see the fire trends. So the extrusion-based bioprinting technique is the most commonly used technique due to its fast printing speed the, in terms of volume per minute. And also it has a wider, wider range of printable bio inks. And furthermore, the rapid development of novel bio inks and bioprinting strategies has enabled the fabrication of human scale tissue constructs using the extrusion-based bioprinting approach. Takes for the material jetting approach. So it's uh, more attractive for fabrication of smaller tissue and organs by enabling the drop-on-demand printing of different types of cells and biomaterials on the same planar surface to improve the cell-cell and also cell matrix interaction. And lastly, the vet polymerization. So it has several advantages such as high printing resolution, a wide range of printable viscosity and also high printable cell density. And furthermore, the development of new photo initiators facilitate uh, cross-linking in the visible light region, which induce less DNA damage. And also, there's new photo initiators that undergo rapid cross-linking within shorter time frame. So each of these bioprinting techniques has their own unique advantages and limitations. Hence, the choice of suitable bioprinting techniques is highly dependent on the desired application. Next, we will look at the progress in uh, ink development. So usually the ink that were used in the bioprinting techniques, they can be classified as bio inks and also biomaterial inks. So for the bio ink, the cell is the mandatory component, which can be printed with or without the materials. Whereas for the biomaterial ink, they are usually printed to create scaffold. They are subsequently seeded with cells. So here's a list of commonly used ink for bioprinting application. So for the bio ink, we have alginate, Collagen, gelatin, alloric acid, silk fibron, decellularized ECM, the extracellular matrix DECM, the polyethylene glycol PEG, and also pyronic F127. For the biomaterials ink, we have the polycaprolactone, the PCL. And next, we shall look at some of the major impediments in tissue and organ printing. So the advancement in the field of 3D bioprinting over the last two decades has evolved from the printing of living cell droplets to fabrication of 3D complex tissue and organs. Nevertheless, more intensive research work is still required to eventually fabricate functional tissue constructs that are suitable for human transplantation. So there's some important design consideration to eventually overcome these major impediments, which includes achieving biomimicry, vascularization, and also 3D anatomically relevant biological structures. So in the following sections, I'll talk about the different novel bioprinting strategies that can potentially overcome all these challenges. So the main goal of tissue engineering is to try to recreate this uh, biomimetic microenvironment that provides the complex site-specific combination of biochemicals and also mechanical cues to guide the cell adhesion, proliferation, and differentiation during the tissue maturation process. So an in-depth knowledge on the composition and localization of all these ECM proteins 
is important to achieve the envisioned biomimicry. So in this particular study, a multi-material extrusion-based bioprinting system can utilize up to seven different controllable valves to simultaneously deposit multiple ECM components at predefined spatial position to emulate the highly specific biological and physiological function in the native tissue. And next, we look at the different strategies to create vascular light network within the 3D bioprinted tissue constructs. So vascularization remains one of the key bottlenecks in the field of tissue engineering. So the presence of all this complex vascular network is important for the diffusion-based exchange of nutrients and oxygen. So a common strategy to create all these uh, perfusable channels is via the coaxial nozzle printing. So you can see here, usually the biomaterial will be printed via the outer channel, which is then cross-linked by the cross-linker in the inner channel. And it is important to note that the, this method is only applicable to rapid cross-linking material combination. And the other bioprinting techniques to create all these hollow channels is via the use of sacrificial material, such as uh, gelatin or pyronic, which could be removed easily via the reversible temperature-dependent cross-linking mechanism. Next, we look at the 3D anatomically relevant biological structures. So most bio ink utilized in the 3D bioprinting are usually soft and they lack cell supporting properties for printing of highly complex 3D structures. And notably, a novel strategy term, the free form reversible embedding of suspended hydrogels, we can call it fresh and potentially overcome this challenge by printing the ink within a gelatin slurry support bath that maintains the structure fidelity and of the 3D complex structure during the printing process. So this support bath, it exhibits this uh, Brigham plastic behavior during the printing process. So it behaves as a rigid material at low shear stress but becomes a viscous fluid at higher shear stress. So you can see here, this unique behavior enables the, the extruded bio ink from the moving nozzle to be held firmly in place within the buff support buff. And this gelatin support buff, it can be easily removed in a non-destructive manner at a physiological temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. So this gelatin slurry support bath, they'll turn into a liquid at 37 degrees Celsius. And next, we shall look at the different applications. So the role of 3D bioprinting in fabrication of different tissue and organs. So although the fabrication of tissue engineered skin construct may seem like a pretty straightforward process, the native skin has a highly complex structure. It contains different types of skin cells, such as the keratinocytes, the melanocytes, and the fibroblasts, and also have different skin appendages, such as hair follicles, sweat glands, etc., and also different ECM proteins at different regions. So here we can see the fabrication of pigmented skin constructs using the bioprinting techniques. So firstly, it facilitates a more homogeneous cell distribution, and it also enables the patterning of specific cells at the predefined locations. And furthermore, you can see that we are able to tune the microstructure of the microenvironment by depositing different uh, macromolecules within each printed layers. So here we can see uh, 
the some some of the analysis of the printed skin versus the real human skin. So the evaluation of different biomarkers show that the bioprinted skin shows some resemblance to the native human skin. Here you can see the color, the presence of collagen one, collagen five, and different uh, proteins. And next for the cornea bioprinting. So what they have done is the precise patterning of different cornea and retina cells to achieve a, a more homogeneous cell distribution and also to facilitate the important cell-cell interactions. So another important consideration for cornea tissue engineering is the development of a transparent material. So in this work, you can see that the, the group has developed a material with moderate transparency that has suitable mechanical properties for cornea tissue engineering application. And next, we have the cardiac 3D bioprinting. So this work uh, decellularized cardiac ECM and sacrificial material are used to reconstruct uh, miniaturized cardiac constructs. So the different inks, they are printed in a fresh support bath to create the different heart chambers and also the vascular network. So you can see that the 3D bioprinted miniaturized heart construct, they show good structural integrity and also they facilitate the perfusion of different colored dyes within the printed vascular network. Next, we have the bioprinting of liver tissue. So the liver tissue is a very densely packed cellular structure. And some of the prior bioprinting studies have demonstrated the extrusion base of uh, all this biomimetic uh, liver tissue using bio ink with extremely high cell density in the range of about 100 million cells per ml. So the histological analysis of the bioprinted liver tissue, you can see that there's a different distinct uh, intercellular hepatocyte junctions, the endocytes network, and also the biological characterization of the liver construct show uh, sustained expression of the ATP, albumin, and also cytochrome. P450 over four weeks of culture. And furthermore, over here, you can see that the application of drugs induce significant dose dependent toxicity to the bioprinted liver tissue model. So this demonstrates its, its potential for predictive toxicology. Lastly, we have the bioprinting of bone. So a bioprinting study has demonstrated the ability to create vascularized uh, cell-laden bone construct with tunable mechanical properties. So the three key components are the thermoplastic PCL biomaterial ink, which can be printed at different uh, fuel ratio to achieve tunable mechanical strength. We also have the cross-link hydrogel, which provides a biocompatible microenvironment for cell proliferation and differentiation. And lastly, the removal of the sacrificial material to produce hollow channels for potential vascularization. Right now, we shall look at the different complementary strategies to achieve functional tissue and organs. So the bioprinted tissue and organs are not immediately suitable for tissue transplantation. And post-processing step is one of the key essential steps for the living cells to interact, remodel, 
and mature into functional tissue constructs. So most of the tissue engineered constructs are only subjected to static culture conditions, whereas the cells in the native human body they are constantly experiencing the dynamic laminar flow from the blood capillaries. So this mass transfer limitation is more evident in the large in vivo culture of uh, 3D tissue constructs under the static culture conditions. So the use of a bioreactor can, be, can help to improve the mass transport and also the delivery of soluble growth factors and also achieve mechanical conditioning of the perfused tissue constructs. And the next challenge that I want to highlight is the formulation of a common co-culture medium. So it's actually a very challenging task to culture multiple types of cells within a single bioprinted tissue construct. And it is a very daunting task to formulate this uh, common culture medium. So usually, the more sensitive cell type, they should have a higher weightage in the formulation of the co-culture medium. And usually, all these process, they are conducted via a trial and error process. However, with the rise in deep learning, it can be a potential solution for optimization of co-culture medium. So using supervised learning and also the past experimental data, so a model can be trained to help predict the resultant biological end endpoint from the input culture medium parameters value. And this can potentially help to accelerate the culture medium optimization process. Next is the macromolecular crowding. So one of the critical challenges of tissue engineering is to emulate the highly complex uh, extracellular matrix found in the native tissue. So the living cells, they are mainly responsible for creating such complex environment via the ECM production and also remodeling process. And hence, a biophysical approach termed the macromolecular crowding, MMC, can be applied to increase the thermodynamics activities and also the biological process by several orders of magnitude to create ECM-rich tissue constructs. So this MMC is a concept that describes the inter- and intracellular space. So it's a phenomenon that drives the cell biochemistry via the excluded volume effect. So a surrogate markers known as the fractional volume occupancy, FVO, can be used to assess the degree of crowdedness within the solution itself. So the FVO of a human blood lies within the physiological range of about 9 to 54% volume per volume, whereas the FVO in the existing culture medium is significantly lower. And some prior studies have shown that the, when the culture medium is being supplemented with all these uh, macro molecules, it sort of helps to enhance the ECM deposition as shown here. And in another study, it shows that uh, the presence of all these macro molecules help to speed up to create the ECM rich tissue construct within a shorter period of time. And hence, the incorporation of all these macromolecules within the culture medium itself can potentially help to accelerate the tissue maturation process. And conclusion. So in order to create all this uh, functional tissue construct, it is important to have an in-depth understanding of the composition and also the spatial arrangement of the different living cells and ECM proteins within the tissue construct. So this can help us to enhance the cell-cell interaction and also to achieve better biomimicry. And also the advancement in the post-processing steps such as the tissue culture techniques is also necessary for maturating all the biological tissue construct into highly functional tissues. 
And thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Long, for that presentation. We have two questions first. Okay, the first question is, for 3D bioprinting to be feasible, has it been established that structure determines function for any tissue deemed to be bioprintable? So this is from Dr. Reb Juanico from the Technological Institute of the, of the Philippines. The structure. So actually, if you look at the uh, histological analysis of different tissues, right? So usually, in terms of structure, I'll say the, the microenvironment plays a critical role, such as the, the different uh, porosity, the pore sizes, because the, all these will in turn influence the mechanical property of the overall tissue constructs. So all these plays an important part in regulating the cell behavior. So in a certain sense, the, the shape, which is the structure of the printed construct, can play a role in uh, influencing the cell behavior. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, there's another question. Uh, this is, uh, again, from Dr. Reb Wanico. Can a 3D printed brain uh, be possible? So right now, from my understanding, there's uh, some ongoing work in the fabrication of uh, brain, they call it brain organoids. So they are looking at mostly different like neural cells. So they are, actually I'm not an expert in that field, but maybe uh, I can do some, some more reading up on that. Okay, thank you very much, doctor. We will now present the Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Nong Wei Long. So this Certificate of Appreciation is, a, is awarded to Dr. Nong Wei Long for imparting valuable knowledge as a resource speaker during the ASEAN Conference on Additive Manufacturing 2021 with the theme 3D Printing, Revolutionizing the Manufacturing Industry held on October 28, 29, 2021 given this 29th day of October 2021 at the Ducit Thani Hotel, Makati City, Philippines to be signed by Engineer Marianito T. Margarito, Conference Chairman of ACAM 2021 and Dr. Annabel V. Briones, our Director of the ITDI. Thank you.